All you that pain and sorrow bear, praise God and cast on him your care. Lord, in the midst of all that we know, in the midst of all that we endure as well as all that we enjoy, we thank you that in you we can come and lay before you all that is in our hearts and know that you in your great love receive us and all that we give to you and that we can in fact cast all our care upon you because you care for us. And so we pray, O oh Lord, that in this time together, you would open up our hearts and our minds to your presence, that your grace would fro flow freely in our midst, and that we would be drawn to you, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And so we say, form in us that which you desire, O oh God. Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. It is, quite honestly, with all of these esteemed musicians and choir directors and organists in our midst, it is an honor to be a part of this service. And I want to say to all of you who are here, both locally as well as from other parts of the country, you are welcome. I'm very, very glad that you are here. I'm a kind of amateur pianist, love to be a part of music. And why is that so? Because music speaks things to me that the spoken word cannot. It gets down into certain parts of my psyche and, and my mind and my memory and, and my spirit. More often than not, when I think about something that's significant, a song that is related to that incident, whether it be instrumental or vocal, immediately begins to come to mind. It permeates so much of who I am. That's why they pay big bucks to people who write scores for music. I mean, sorry, for movies. Because they know that even if the acting isn't so good, the background music can actually carry the impact of a scene. Or it is profitable for Anglican and Episcopal musicians. But I want to say to you that it is critically important that music be a part of the flow of what we do when we gather together to worship God because it in fact has that same impact. You know, even if the preaching is bad, a mute, the music can carry the service. <laughs> Hopefully that won't be true this morning, but I've seen it happen. But the converse actually is not true. If the music is poor, choir's off key, the pianist is, not the organist, the pianist is kind of getting by. Um, a good sermon is memorable, but what music does is that it allows for the entryway of God's words spoken to hit home in the recesses of the heart that have already been opened through the power of what's happening musically. That's why Plato thought music was so unbelievably dangerous, in fact, and writes of it that way in The Republic. And it is why also that music, especially singing, has an extraordinary place in worship, both in the Hebrew Scriptures as well as in the Christian Testament. The call to sing and to make music resounds again and again and again, because it is in fact music that lifts the heart. When we get to that point in the service where I, a celebrant, will say, lift up your hearts, and you will say, we lift them up unto the Lord, the actual action that will take place in that moment will have everything to do both with our attentiveness, so that it's not just sort of rolling off our tongue, but also it will have everything to do with what has happened up to that moment that prepares us to be able, with actually great vulnerability, to open all of who we are to God, to God. 
it seems like a small thing, a melody line, a particular piece of music, even a, a single note. I still remember the line in the movie about Mozart where Salieri is talking about in one of Mozart's pieces where a note, a high note, just hangs in the air, impossibly long, he says, but at the same time, exactly right. And that's what moved him. They're small things, you see. They are, to use the scripture, they are seeds. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is like a man who scatters seeds. That is certainly my hope for what happens musically here. That it is an action that God uses literally to scatter the seeds of the kingdom. As I was yesterday sort of sitting in my, I have a reading chair, it's where I go. And I'm sitting in my reading chair, and I'm reading the parables, and I'm looking at the commentaries. I'm thinking about the, the occasion. And I, and I had this vision in my, in my mind. It may be too much, but I'm going to share it anyway. I had this vision of what happens when a choir sings and the musicians play in a service of worship. If their ministry and they as persons are welcomed, accepted, seen as fellow members of the body of Christ, whose ministry is in fact valued and important, something wondrous happens. But if that is not the case, if musicians feel as if somehow they're, being, they're fighting to be accepted, always seen a little bit on the periphery, not quite at the center of things, you know, kind of hired hands that we may or may not be able to do with, something else happens. When they begin to sing and they're in that place of feeling isolation, they're up in the balcony, they're doing their best, but you know what actually happens? Because of the anger and the resentment that's inside of them, the musical notes, instead of coming over to us in the congregation, like a breath of fresh air, almost feels like they're throwing rocks from the balcony. Musical offerings as angry pleas to the rest of the congregation. Please accept us. We know we're just a little weird and out of the ordinary. We are artists after all. But don't reject us. Make room for us here. We too want to be see as seen as agents of God. But when the opposite is the case, when music is seen as offering into which we are all invited, corporate praise to God that does in fact lift our hearts, a legitimate expression of the kingdom begins to happen. Here musicians are not throwing rocks. Instead I see them from the balcony literally sending through their music shafts of light like arrows over the top of the balcony, hitting their mark and awakening the very embers of God's spirit that is within us who gather. So that when we say we lift them up to the Lord, it has been duly prepared by music and by worship and by prayer. And we know that we're entering into something that is in fact larger than ourselves. What is my hope for the church? That kind of church, it is, I see and long for that kind of church to literally see themselves as an ecosystem for the soul. An organism committed to the development and the nourishment of people in Christ. And thus, and this is what's important, what begins to happen when that's how a church sees herself I use the feminine because she is the bride of Christ. When she sees herself as that kind of ecosystem committed to the nurturing of literally the whole person, an ecosystem for the soul, what begins to happen is that people in that church begin to see themselves as seeds of the kingdom who are willing wherever they are, whether that be within the context of the office or whether it is a, at a party or no matter where it is, it actually doesn't matter, you see, because the earth is the Lord's. And they see themselves in that location, in that place, as a seed. The God is planted there for his use and for his service. So that it literally becomes this network 
influence for the kingdom that begins to touch all of the various corners of society, wherever we are, whether that be within the law courts, whether that be in entertainment, whether that be in the arts, whether that be in education, whether that be in business, it doesn't matter. God's Lord of all of it. What matters is how we see ourselves in the midst of it. Because you see, many of us, in fact, do not see ourselves as seeds of the kingdom. <laughs> we just see ourselves as human beings just trying to get by. Author Wesley Hill tells the story of a Yale student who was studying under the renowned Old Testament professor Brevard Childs. The student got a poor grade on his undergraduate paper, and he went to Professor Childs and asked him how he could improve his grade. Of course, what he's thinking about is technique. Professor Childs smiled and replied, become a deeper person. Most of what we think about as success in this kind of myopically self-centered culture is about the acquisition of technique. Success in business, 10 ways to improve your retirement fund, how to be better at conversation, Five easy steps. It is extraordinarily pervasive and not unhelpful, except that they never actually get to the heart of the matter. John Tyson, a New York City pastor, posted this recently online. If we are not a generation in love with ourselves, we are undeniably a generation obsessed with ourselves. When we stand before reality, preoccupied with ourselves, we see precious little of what is actually there to be seen in the world. Moreover, what little we do see will be distorted and shaped by our own self-interest, our own self-preoccupation. The outside world has little power to penetrate or even distract us in the end. Our reality has been reduced to the size, shape, and color of our own inner world. It is not surprising that many have trouble believing in God when we have trouble perceiving any reality at all beyond ourselves and our own self-interest. Jesus, in these parables of the kingdom, call us to something and to someone beyond ourselves. Jesus is calling us to himself and to give ourselves to becoming seeds of the kingdom in the world where he has placed us. If I understand my role and my goal in life is that kind of interior preoccupation, getting the things done that I need to get done. See my hand? It feels like that, doesn't it, sometimes? Then I will always have that kind of inner myopic vision. I will look at people only in the ways that they can help me. I will never see themselves as persons. I will only watch those news channels and read the news sources that actually help me. I will not be challenged to think about the world more broadly than my own self-preoccupations and will be utterly convinced that if somebody comes at me with a new idea or to see something differently than I see in myself, I'll automatically assume that either they're dishonest or they haven't done their research or perhaps even they're frauds. It takes a lot to get over the terrible wall that I have built around myself to protect myself from the people and the arguments with which I disagree and the people with whom I do not like. That is not being Christian. But it permeates into Christianity when I see my Christianity, regardless of where I am theologically or the left or on the right, as a kind of defense system where I surround people who think and believe just like me so that I can make sure I can preserve the truth, whatever that is, so that I literally build a kind of echo chamber within the body of Christ where the only thing that comes back at me are the people who say exactly what I want them to say. Isn't that idolatry? But to be willing to give myself as a seed means wherever I am, I'm saying, God, what would you have me do? With whom would you have me speak? 
being open for God to use me wherever and with whom. In fact, it does not matter. Because God, you see, we have this dangerous idea that God actually loves all people equally. It's a very dangerous thing to believe. Most of us believe people who God loves more are the people who think and act just like I do. Everybody else is in sin and they need to repent or at least come to the knowledge of the truth. But if my heart is open, I mean genuinely open, for God to use me, it becomes life-changing. Knowing that we are well-known to God, as Paul writes in Corinthians, that he holds us in the palm of our hand, and they're willing to be servants. That's what a seed is. A seed is innocuous, it's tiny, just scattered on the road. It seems profligate. It's a kind of generosity to which we're not used to, even though it was a common agricultural metaphor in, in Jesus' day. So that wherever we are, we're thinking, we're praying, our hearts are open, we're looking at people as real people. It takes a kind of discipline to sit in a restaurant and look at some, uh, one of your waitstaff 